to provide the safest and most combat capable aircraft that we possibly can. The penetrating sound of an F-16 fighter jet overhead should be the enemy's worst fear. It's the backbone of the Air Force. The F-16s in this fighter group are operating out of a camp near the Iraqi border. Their air-to-surface missions over Iraq launched from here have cleared a path for ground forces advancing into Baghdad. It really is the, uh, the task at hand. The F-16 pilots fly 24 to 36 missions a day, and they're making their bombing runs with just 12 aircraft. Not much downtime here. Most of the time we do about a two and a half hour turn time between the time that they land and the time that they go again. Lieutenant Colonel Berge, that's his call sign, has been climbing into an F-16 cockpit for 18 years. He says the quick turnaround is part of the job, but when we asked about friendly fire incidents, he says that's one part of the job pilots take great pains to avoid when they take off on a mission. We make 100% sure that what we're uh, targeted against is a one military target and two, it's uh, not one of ours. At first light, the British Army convoy pulled out. By daybreak, it was cutting through the checkpoint into Iraq. Kuwait was in its rearview mirror. More than 30 trucks, all full of diesel fuel, headed for an undisclosed supply hub for U.S. troops 250 miles south of Baghdad. There's not an awful lot to see around us. Corporal Blake pointed out, as far as the eyes could see, nothing but desert. On the highway, signs of what used to be a busy thoroughfare. We've got the army with us as well, so that's making, you know, that's bumping the numbers up, and it's... Uh... Certainly one of the largest convoys I've been involved in. A convoy this size, as they all do, draw attention. All along the highway, children ran up to the side of the road, waving as if it's their duty to welcome the troops. By and large, they seem to be uh, quite happy to see us, as you saw yourself, and, and waving at us and everything. The troops, though, were happy to see their destination, but then there was a problem. At this point, we've been driving three and a half hours. We made it to our supply destination. But there's one thing about working in this desert sand. Sometimes these big trucks get stuck. The dusty sand was like adhesive wrapping around the wheels. The trucks couldn't move. The trucks have been driving too close together. Um, they need to give some decent speed up coming through the soft sand. They've not been doing that. So once one, once one, one vehicle stops, it just cause like a roll-on effect anyway. So it's all good fun. It certainly kept the day interesting, digging out at least three trucks and pulling out the rest with the heavy-duty recovery truck, with a little help, of course. The uh, American guys are having us pull, pull one out at the minute. I think that's off, isn't it? Fuel is the military's lifeline, and a lot of it runs through this fuel depot 250 miles south of Baghdad in the Iraqi desert. Line. They are just bringing the fuel from one truck into the bags. British and U.S. forces tow these lines, pumping millions of gallons of diesel into large fuel bags. Yes, go straight to the front line. The temporary storage depot, though, will be replaced by a pipeline that will stretch from here to a fuel point just outside Baghdad. The workload will drop for these troops, 
but efficiency goes up. I think it'll be quite important because it uh, will uh, ensure that all the troops are then refueled quicker. You know, save, it also saves the mileage on the tankers. Tankers pull in here by the hundreds a day. One sergeant told us his unit has run more than a million gallons of fuel to the front. Still, millions more will be stored here for the weeks and possibly months ahead. We're waiting on the rest of our bags and liners, and then we're going to be holding about 3.5 million worth of gallons of fuel. I'd rather be out here now fighting this war so my kids don't have to come out here. Out here is a Camp Lejeune Marines base camp along the Kuwait-Iraq border. You learn to adapt day by day. Out here, in this sun-drenched desert, the dust flies like the flags that stand tall over this base camp, and the work almost never grinds to a halt. Back in the rear, it's usually a normal work day unless we go on um, op operations for training. But here is drills, and all day is you're in the work environment. Most of the troops here are young Marines at work, building bunkers, moving supplies from here to the front, on guard 24-7, young Marines clutching rifles, on duty, at work. When Corporal William Morales isn't heading up a squad, he's rifling through his toolbox. Only thing I think about is this piece of gear needs to get working. I grab my toolbox and I head out, then I fix it. Life in this base camp is a daily grind, nothing like home. Although for some of these troops, thoughts of home get them through the day. It's hard. I'm not, I can't say I can put my wife or my kids aside, but I, I do my work first, and then if I have time, I think about my family. Ken Smith, WREL News. The bombs they load drop from F-16 fighter jets, the backbone of the Air Force. When you just come to the military, yeah, you think about it, but after a while you've been around these bombs and different airframes, it just come normal routine. So it's nothing really new to me. <laughs> What's new, though, is that this is not a drill. It's war, and their timing and precision must be as sharp as the men and women who fly these jets. We've got a big job to do, and we've got to get done as quick as possible to get the jets back up in the air. These weapons maintainers work together like a NASCAR pit crew, racing to get their job done when every minute counts. The men and women working this flight line stay busy, working 12-hour shifts, and sometimes the turnaround is very quick. They sometimes have to get an aircraft prepped and ready to go within an hour of its landing. That quick work means another mission can get off the ground. And for these men and women on this flight line, at least part of their job is done. It's a good feeling. It's, it's even better feeling when it comes back without the bombs. 
Ken Smith, WREL News, Kuwait. It's drawn down quite a bit uh, compared to the beginning just three weeks ago. The number of A-10s taking off on bombing runs have dropped since coalition forces moved into Baghdad. Now the troops working with these hogs have some extra time to play with. It's kind of a time for us to be able to step back and take a deep breath. <laughs> At the height of the conflict, A-10s were taking off from this base near the Iraqi border, sometimes every two to three hours. But like the war, times have changed. Now it's just kind of, you know, rolling into that, what are we going to do next? Or when's this thing really going to be, you know, completely over? Since the Saudis have been scaled back, the missions are now longer, sometimes five to six hours, giving the men and women on the flight line plenty of downtime. But every now and then something happens that reminds them that this is still an active flight line. Everybody just ran over there tried to help out. Just as this A-10 was prepping to take off, smoke started pouring out of the engines. The crews made quick work of the problem, though. No one was hurt. And that extra time the crews had, well, this aircraft took care of that. But it's all in a day's work on the flight line. Anytime we have a jet burn and anything going on, we all kind of want to get in there and help out just to make sure the jet's safe and the crew is all right. And so they, the, um, what would they do with this? Uh, American flags that are given to us. Um, as we accept the flag. We fly for our family members and also uh, besides. Some of our family members. That they have already taken off and started to work on. Obviously, some of these are, are not going to go back on the jet, but. Um. Our training prepares us for this, for this kind of environment. The Camp Lejeune Marines at this base camp pushed tons of equipment forward. For them, the desert elements were the enemy. While they were closer to the Iraqi border than the battle, still, the war changed minds and attitudes. It makes me have extra, more, more purpose in life. It makes me not take things for granted as much as I used to. I'm more aware of sounds now. First Lieutenant Marisol Cantu experienced change just before she got deployed. This diamond ring changed her future. The sounds of war, though, changed her personally. You know, any sound that I hear, you don't know what it's going to be. You don't know if it's a scud. You don't know if it's a missile. You just got to kind of be alert to your surroundings and know where you're at and, um, you know, don't take anything for granted. For these troops in the rear, staying alert kept them alive. Now they have a newfound appreciation for life after the war. And I remember uh, watching the Gulf War on TV when I was a lot younger and thinking, wow, glad I'm not there. And I know a lot of people back home are doing the same thing, but now I'm here and now I'm doing something. And as long as I live, I'll be proud of that.
we train very hard for this, this type of operation. When British forces secured the Iraqi town of Basra, it was another town added to its military resume of missions accomplished around the world. A lot of the um, type of operations that we had to uh, deal with in Basra, for instance, uh, fighting in the build-up areas, is something that we've conditioned, uh, we've been conditioned to over a number of years, working in the Balkans, working in Northern Ireland, uh, and in, indeed working in Afghanistan more recently. I think that's off, isn't it? From the front lines to the rear, British forces make up about 20% of coalition forces, including the 7th Transport Regiment. The troops here have been running fuel and other supplies into Iraq. Their biggest battle, they tell me, is with the weather. But they've found a way to fight back. Lots of sunblock. We've been issued with goggles and uh, lightweight coveralls so that when we're working, you're not wearing big, heavy coveralls. While the work rolls on in the rear for these troops, they haven't forgotten their fellow soldiers and Royal Marines who won't be making it back to their families. It's an ultimate prize these soldiers won't forget. I'm married, I've got a wife back in Wales, um, two children. And especially when I read that these people that have died during the conflict, you know, married and small children and all that, I just feel for them. When the branches of the military needed a secure link to each other, the 263rd Combat Communications Squadron got orders to provide it. So we actually work for the 82nd, 101st, the 3rd, and the 4th. Everyone, anyone that needs communication coming through here, voice or data, we provide it. The North Carolina Air National Guard unit works out of this camp just outside Kuwait City. Obviously with the challenges of a combat area, be it you know, missile attacks, just the environment itself, no complaints, everybody's worked real hard, everybody's just really proud to be here. For many of these troops, they're doing their civilian jobs only in uniform. Both of my positions complement each other and, and the, the skills and the experience I get benefit each other. Not so though for other troops like Tech Sergeant Ed Krasinski, he's an insurance guy turned radio operator for the red, white and blue. It's uh, definitely a difference, uh, much more fast paced at, at my real job. The unit's camp is next to Kuwait International. Seeing these jets take off every day gets them thinking about what they're most looking forward to after this assignment. Getting back to my, my new bride. Lobster and a rare steak. And the family, of course. <laughs> not necessarily in that order. No, no, not in that order. <laughs> When the A-10 is prepped for duty, it's fully loaded with bombs and enough firepower to carve up a tank. We fly low, we fly medium. Captain Bash going over her pre-flight checklist and Captain KC heading out to the flight line are the only two female combat pilots with the 75th Fighter Squadron. Between them, they've flown countless bombing runs over Baghdad. 
So I want to be dropping bombs and shooting the gun, helping our guys out on the ground. This is Captain Casey's A-10 that got hit with anti-aircraft fire when she was providing ground support. She's been back in the cockpit more than four times since enemy artillery took a bite out of this aircraft. I think the best thing about flying the A-10 is the, uh, the missions that we fly, close air support, combat search and rescue. For Captain Bass, though, no such close calls yet. This is my first experience in, in uh, this type of combat. And with no combat experience, she relied on her training that first time out. There was a little apprehension because I didn't know what to expect, the unknown, but uh, it's the excitement. You've trained so long for this, this one moment, and it's there. Ken Smith, WREL News. While it may not look it from the dusty landscape, this corner of the Iraqi desert is an international work site. It's uh, been quite a good team so far. Here at this fuel depot, British and U.S. forces are working together, supplying diesel to troops securing major towns in Iraq. This is the third time we've been up here now in this location to help out with fuel. And it's working really well, building up some good friendships up here. We work together pretty good. Don't have any problems. The troops work side by side, each pulling their own weight and working towards the same goal. The term coalition isn't just about a multi-nation force dismantling the Iraqi regime. On the ground here in the dusty sands of Iraq, it means one military pulling each other forward one mile at a time. The success of the military partnership is in the numbers. This fuel depot will eventually store more than three million gallons of fuel. Professionalism is a a plus. I think uh, they're doing an excellent job doing uh, their part of the mission uh, out here with what, they're, what they have going on. That work ethic apparently cuts both ways and is mutual. They are very friendly, just nice people, willing to give you things. If we haven't got stuff, they're willing to help us out. Two countries building a coalition in war for peace. Ken Smith, WREL News in the Iraqi desert. From the grave he arose. From the sound of it, Easter has dawned in the desert. These soldiers in arms at this sunrise service are also soldiers in Christ, relying on their weapons for protection and their faith for survival. I think it uh, helps you to get you through the day. They can hear that still quiet. For First Lieutenant Vanessa Kovac, having gotten engaged just before this deployment, her spirituality fills the void of leaving home. It's that, that happy thought that keeps you going throughout the day, gives you that moments to reflect and you have something to reflect on always helps. That Jesus did taste death on our behalf and he was resurrected and now he was here. The troop's spiritual caretaker is Captain Ken Lebrone, raised Catholic, attended a Presbyterian yeah. seminary and married a Southern yeah. Baptist. He is well equipped to take care of the spiritual needs of the close to 500 members of the 37th Engineer Battalion. I heard one time that the uh, most powerful weapon in the uh, military runs on water. And that just serves to remind me that the most powerful weapon in the military is the human being. And they have a spiritual side and it needs care. This spiritual guidance comes as these troops get ready to head north into Iraq. They're not only traveling by highway, but by faith. Ken Smith, WREL News, traveling with the 37th Engineer Battalion from Fort Bragg. We've left the Kuwaiti desert, but not desert conditions. Photographer Ken Korn and I and about 200 members of the 37th Engineer Battalion from Fort Bragg are at a camp for Chinooks and Black Hawk helicopters about 30 miles southwest of Baghdad. Now to get here, we passed through a town called al Iskandaria. We saw tanks abandoned all over this neighborhood. Some were in people's front yards. Some tanks were on the side of the road looking as if Iraqi soldiers left in a hurry. This one, though, bore the mark of a coalition forces air assault. We even saw a cache of live artillery stacked up near somebody's house. Now, getting rid of that type of material is part of the mission of the 37th Engineer Battalion. 
Now, it has taken us 20 hours to get where we are. We stopped a couple of times to refuel. Last night, we stopped to get some rest. We got about four or five hours of rest, but the journey isn't over yet. We're headed still north of Baghdad. For photographer Ken Korn, traveling with Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion, I'm Ken Smith, WREL News, just outside Baghdad. We've been traveling now for about 12 hours, which has gotten us to this point north of Baghdad, but it was slow going today, and here's why. We traveled through the southern sector of Baghdad, and that's the area where the third ID secured during the siege of Baghdad. Crowds of people flooded the streets and nearby markets. We were trapped in uh, a traffic jam for most of the way through this town, but this is a sign that uh, many people in parts of Iraq are getting back to their daily lives. Now, once we got through this congestion, we were able to pull off the road. Some of the troops were able to check their vehicles. Others looked at the scraps of this war. These Iraqi uniforms were laying out in this open field. It also gave all of us a chance to stretch our legs. Now, this has been a long haul, but the troops are forging on. They are ready to get down to business because we are linking up with the 101st Airborne Division. For photographer Ken Korn, traveling with Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion, I'm Ken Smith, WREL News north of Baghdad. Horton? At a military camp just outside Baghdad, the U.S. Postal Service delivered 18 bags full of letters and boxes addressed to Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion. We've been out here about a month and five days now, and we finally got everything. The first mail call in five weeks for these troops since they were deployed. They could use it after dealing with the worst of what nature can dole out in the desert. First Lieutenant Courtney Hirsch is an NC State grad. She got a letter from an old college roommate. Because I wasn't expecting it at all. So just to know that there are a lot of people back home. Garnu! PFC Garnu got the lion's share of the packages. It looked like he was about to open his own post exchange. Garnu! Whoa! Actually, he used his business skills to sell the community on supporting the truth. There's a very generous family medicine clinic back where I live who's adopted my platoon. They sent the whole platoon candy and stuff, and there's also a third grade class who adopted our company. For now, the business of the battalion is on hold. Mail is a priority. For photographer Ken Korn, traveling with the 37th Engineer Battalion from Fort Bragg, I'm Ken Smith, WREL News, outside Baghdad. Garnu! highways, a military convoy is as much a part of the traffic as the villagers who wave them through. This one, the 37th Engineer Battalion, is going cross-country from the south to northern Iraq, and the lament of the troops was removed. Are there yet? Are we there yet? Moving about 100 vehicles, Hummers, heavy equipment, trucks, close to 900 miles, was a first for the 37th, and not just in time and distance. Well, as far as baths and showers go, that's, that's the toughest part. <laughs> but food, we're okay. But other than that, the seating arrangement, the seating is tough. The sun set on this convoy four times, and each day, the tally would rise on the number of vehicles buckling under the long haul, but it was still considered minimal for a battalion this size. A couple of the 25-ton trailers, we lost a few axles on them. Uh, a couple of the air compressors, lost an axle on there. Uh, some of the smaller trailers, one or two sides, 
uh, basically we was uh, down to the point of chaining, chaining up one side or the other and, and driving off. 40 hours on the road and the troops pull into Mosul and a not so welcoming Saddam portrait. For the 37th Engineer Battalion, it was a job just getting here, but now the real work begins. For photographer Ken Corn, I'm Ken Smith, WRAL News, Mosul. In the field, a soldier's work is never done. And Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion has very little downtime, setting up camp in northern Iraq. When I got to this unit, I saw how fast-paced everybody was and busy. The workload then and now didn't leave much time for spiritual counseling. That's when Battalion Chaplain Ken Laban reached for his trusty slinky. This wiry toy got him through some stressful times at the seminary. He figured it could help keep the troops on the straight and narrow. Over the time, uh, over the time that I've been with them, I've realized that they don't have time to slow down and just sit and chat with the chaplain. So I used the slinky as an illustration for little mini two-minute sermons. Father Jacob Samples remembers his slinky sermon. It stays together in the, in the desert sun. There, it gets pretty hot, and uh, every year. Uh, it apart, the metal doesn't stay together, so it gets cool quick. That's uh, pretty much the same thing that uh, you do as Christians. You try to stay together tight to keep the warmth there. It's very addictive. It's never very far from Specialist Christopher Lambert's reach. I do break it out of my bag and play with it when times do get hard. It'll come in handy since he'll miss his daughter's first birthday next month. And just in case you're wondering, photographer Ken Court and I have been outfitted with our slinkies and words to live by as well. Ken Smith, WRBL News, Mosul. Crazy. And that's what that is. That's what those rounds in there were. On this heavily guarded hill in northern Iraq, soldiers with Fort Bragg's engineering battalion watch their step, and for good reason. Small arms. And that's just for starters. This Iraqi ammunition supply point in Mosul is loaded with enough weapons and ammunition to fight a war. That's the caliber of, of most AK-47. Plenty of firepower laid out over two to three miles, stockpiled in bunkers, abandoned by Iraqi soldiers. It's now up to the combat engineers of the 37th Bravo Company to reduce part of this arsenal to rubble. Every box you touch, every box you move in there, you treat it like it's booby trap. Don't get complacent. For some of these young soldiers listening to Sergeant Weller, this is the first time this mission is not a drill. We walk in the wood line. We don't know if we're going to find mines or any booby traps on the demo. So we're kind of nervous about it, but we come to the end that everything is going to be fine. We divide this into nine zones, and within those nine zones, we've subdivided it based upon all the different caches that we think are out here. Bravo Company Commander Captain Richard Bowen is pinpointing the target zone. We have this large landmass full of all types of munitions. So now we have to go through and systematically figure out exactly what we have. Getting rid of this stockpile of weapons and ammunition isn't just a priority for Bravo Company, but also for establishing security in this country. For photographer Ken Korn, I'm Ken Smith, WREL News, Mosul. The firefight kicked off around 8 o'clock here in Mosul Monday night. 
Now, from where we're encamped with Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion Bravo Company, we could hear clearly sudden bursts of gunfire. We could also see traces lighting up the night sky. Now, that lasted for a good two hours. Military intelligence are telling us that they're members of the Ba'ath Party and other uh, anti-coalition factions in and around Mosul. We're not sure which group of rebels engaged U.S. forces in that firefight. Now, as for the 37th, we're at an Iraqi ammo supply point. It's one of the largest cache of weapons, ammo, and explosives found here in northern Iraq, and that's why the 37th is here to get rid of it. And any time we're this close to this much firepower and the rebels are using firearms, company commanders say this is still considered a war zone, so we were on high alert uh, wearing our Cavalier helmets and flag vests. Now, we are surrounded by a heavily guarded perimeter, but the com company commanders wanted to be on the safe side. So we remained on high alert for a good four hours after that firefight. Ken Smith, WRAL News, Mosul. On this hillside in northern Iraq, two worlds, soldiers with Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion on one side, villagers on the next, curious about what's going on. They are as close as a reach across a fence, but separated by words. That's where PFC Raouf Saber comes in, born in Egypt, fluent in Arabic, and a soldier with Bravo Company. I didn't want to go to Ohio to college right after school. I didn't want to just keep studying. I wanted to take a break. Two years removed from high school, Saber is back in the Arab region he left with his family six years ago. Here, he's explaining to these villagers what the military is doing nearby. And his work doesn't end here. Where's Saber at? Saber has the ears of his top commanders interpreting Arabic symbols and writings on weapons and ammo in hillside bunkers. It feels good to, to, like, to, know, to know what's going on around me. Saber's job as a combat engineer is to blow up weapons caches, but in this hot spot where misunderstanding can lead to conflict, his language skills are cooling tempers as it did here and creating understanding between the troops and the Iraqi people. For photographer Ken Korn, I'm Ken Smith, WRBL News, Mosul. لا 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 ما فيش ما فيش أذى في شيء هاي مجال ما نتكلم ما مش يعني كذا تمام في أي سؤال عايزين أي أي سؤال رأو الأرضية كلها أمان أمان كل تشاف المنطقة كبيرة أو فلازم يدخلوا هاي مساحة كل حاجة فيها زي ما قلت لك هو قال لي دلوقتي المنطقة اللي هناك كده دلوقتي فيها حاجات كتير مستقعات زي ما بقول لك اه مخازن These are buried mines, you bury them, and then once it takes about 500 pounds of pressure. Mm -hmm. That's why the world's fighting so hard to get rid of mines. Once the grip stock's in place, there's a battery in here which also activates the, uh, it's like RISF, a mortar or something of that nature. These ceramic casing, the electronics. No, 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 no. Don't even put it on your shoulder. Put that.
The Bedouin tribes call these hills overlooking Mosul home. These hills are also the site of one of Iraq's largest weapons cache, Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion Bravo Company plans to blow up. With the help of PFC Rahouf Saber, who speaks fluent Arabic, this farmer told us they're not interested in the weapons, just a wooden crate that litter the ground. We need fire to cook and stay warm. Why can't we get firewood? The trouble is, it's not just the Bedouins Bravo Company is trying to keep out of this area, but rebel forces around Mosul that rifled through the weapons and explosives before the U.S. military rolled into this compound. It creates an unsafe environment because rounds are now exposed. Um, and then two, we can't really identify a friend or foe, especially at night, if a guy just wants some wood or if a guy is after the rounds. These three farmers, between them, have 25 children. They could use the firewood. They also know the risks of trying to get it from this weapons depot. A couple of days ago, one of the farmer's leg got cut off from a, tra a shrapnel from a landmine. We know, what's, we know what's in there. As a gesture of goodwill, soldiers with the 37th gathered some wood and gave it to the appreciative farmers. That gratitude is a matter of survival. For the veterans, that wood means a warm tent and hot meals for their families. For photographer Ken Korn, traveling with Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion, I'm Ken Smith, WREL News, Mosul. Already got the chip wire package with the Valmar. First Sergeant James Dickens, Bravo Company, a combat engineer for more than 20 years. Back here, this is a... VS 2.2 anti tank mine. A very nasty mine. First Sergeant Dickens knows his weapons and ammo, but he says some of the landmines the troops uncovered in these bunkers he's only seen in pictures. More mines in here. As we went deeper into this bunker, the stockpile of landmines reached the ceiling. This is one of the larger caches of mines that we found in this bunker complex. Very significant finds. Old classic anti tank mines that could have been around here for decades. Bangalore torpedoes, and these Chinese wooden mines that first surfaced during the Vietnam War. In a wooden mine, you can't detect this. There's very little metal at all. All part of an Iraqi arsenal, Fort Bragg's 37th Engineer Battalion will destroy. Mines are our biggest enemy right now. Before Bravo Company gets down to work, though, U.S. military intelligence teams will sort through these landmines. They could contain useful information for U.S. troops fighting future wars. They can study and we can then train American soldiers on what to look for and how to identify the, what different types of mines there are out there. At least the cache of landmines found here won't be among them. For photographer Ken Korn, I'm Ken Smith, WRBL News, Mosul. Hey, let me know if we get to 200, sir. Two rows, two rows, straight down the track. You want to crush that first.